topic today is, is about carbon dioxide and its forcing and whether in fact it has any impact on climate at all. Just uh, we've seen this diagram a couple of times today. The top uh, blue one is in fact the temperature at Vostok. The one underneath is carbon dioxide. Al Gore says they're going in lockstep and know the carbon dioxide is forcing the temperature, but uh, it seems pretty clear that the carbon dioxide is, is following the temperature. Just after 1500, the CO2 record dips, uh, not very much, but that's during the sort of the little ice age. Around about 1750, it starts to rise again, uh, quite a bit before the uh, Industrial Re Revolution really took off, and then in the more recent period, it uh, has really uh, skyrocketed, and this is what uh, is being claimed. It's going to force climate and it's causing the, the recent warming. But this one, you know, which shows the fraction of the human emissions into the atmosphere that are retained. But we see that it's only about 45% of the human emissions into the atmosphere that are actually retained by the atmosphere. So as the human emissions per year go up, so the amount of uptake by the natural system. So there is these natural sinks that are also increasing as carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere. If we have no uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the total emission to space is around about 286 watts per square metre. We put in 50 parts per million and it's 267. We've dropped about 20 watts per square metre. So doubling from 400 to 800, we only reduce the outgoing radiation by about 3 watts per square metre. There is a logarithmic relationship between uh, carbon dioxide and the, and the change in emission. What I've done here is put this in the context of water vapour. We often hear about how does carbon dioxide compare to water vapour. Most of the greenhouse effect is by the water vapour and the first 50 parts per million or even less of, uh, of carbon dioxide. As we've added carbon dioxide, we haven't really changed the, the radiation forcing or the greenhouse effect that very much. This is from geostationary satellite up over the north of Australia. What we're looking at is the very cold cloud tops, minus uh, 100 watts per square, uh, sorry, 100 watts per square meter coming from those very cold cloud tops. Where there's no cloud, we're seeing right down in the uh, in the atmosphere, almost at the surface, around about uh, 300 watts per square meter. So here we've got this huge variation in radiation <coughs> in space, just because of cloud or no cloud. And so it's been pointed out by uh, by Linton and others that. Uh, this very small greenhouse effect, could that not be uh, compensated by just a small change in the cloudiness? Let's now look at the, sort of the global energy budget. What we've been looking at is variations in this infrared radiation to space. But that's only one component. We have the solar radiation coming in through here. Part of it has been reflected from the clouds. Part of it's from, reflected from the surface. And we're absorbing about 168 units at the surface. The greenhouse gases, but it's not only carbon dioxide, but it's water vapour, cloud and so forth, they're interacting with radiation that's being emitted by the, the surface. This is this black body radiation of 390 watts per square metre. <coughs> that is largely absorbed by the atmosphere, in fact the low atmosphere, about 40 watts goes straight through the, the atmospheric window. <coughs> what we really want to do is to look at how the surface radiation and the evaporation change with the back radiation. How does the back radiation change with carbon dioxide? With no, with no moisture and no carbon dioxide, there's very little back radiation. <coughs> Add in moisture, 230, so water vapour is a very strong, uh, very effective greenhouse gas. Add in uh, the first 50 parts of carbon dioxide, and that increases, but then we add uh, further carbon dioxide, doubling it, and again, it's only about 3 watts per square metre increase in the downward flux of, of uh, back radiation. So, doubling the carbon dioxide from what it is now, about 400 to 800, will only increase the back radiation by about 3 watts per square metre. But if we increase the surface temperature by 1 degree, we increase the infrared radiation and the latent energy, each by about 5 watts per square metre. Put this into a, just a little slide here. We increase the surface temperature by 1 degree, increase the surface IO emission by 5 watts per square metre, we increase the latent energy exchange by 5 watts per square metre. We've got to have 10 watts per square metre increase in back radiation to sustain that 1 degree. The doubling CO2 only gives us 3 watts per square metre. So the 3 watts per square metre will only increase the surface temperature by about 0.3 uh, 
degrees uh, centigrade. How does the uh, computer models get these figures of three, six degrees centigrade? The average IPCC models predict a uh, doubling of CO2 concentration gives a three degrees centigrade temperature increase. Going back to our previous graph of five watts per square metre for each degree, that means the total increase in surface emissions and latent energy is about 30 watts per square metre. And that's uh, something we can sort of calculate fairly readily. But if we go back to the, the calculations of back radiation using the very uh, sophisticated models that we spoke about this morning, we find that even by doubling the carbon dioxide, increasing the atmospheric temperature by three degrees, and having constant relative humidity, which is the, again, the, the IPCC's uh, uh, claim, the back radiation is only 18 watts per square metre. The physics of the carbon dioxide and radiation causing will not sustain the 30 watts that's required for a 3 degrees temperature increase. So it's my view that uh, there's something very much wrong with the computer models. So I guess what I really want to, uh, to summarise is that uh, CO2 is an agent for climate change, but it decreases in effectiveness as concentration increases. This point was recognised by IPCC in its first assessment report. It had a logarithmic equation, and I haven't been able to find it in any of the subsequent uh, papers. That's an inconvenient truth. <laughs> Bill Priestley pointed out that over well-watered surfaces, there is a constraint on the high temperatures. And as a, an aside, he said, the ocean temperatures will be restrained to about 30 degrees centigrade as well. I certainly am very confident that a doubling of CO2 concentration has only a limited impact on global surface temperature, and I would be surprised if we got much more than about 0.3 of a degree. The discussion came up this morning about uh, uh, this, uh, over the sort of the ice age cycle, that for some reason Earth started to warm, and about a thousand years later carbon dioxide uh, increased, and therefore this started a, a positive feedback process and amplified, and so we get the, the ice sheets melting and so forth. But at this stage, uh, we don't have any processes to what stopped that amplification at about the temperature that we are now, or a little bit warmer than we are now, at every sort of glacial cycle over the last million years. It's warmed to about, or a little bit warmer than we are now, and then cooled off again. And my feeling is that the, the negative feedback is the fact that evaporation increases so rapidly with temperature that this is the, the damping factor. Interspersed, of course, between those warming periods, uh, there were some cooler periods. I'd like to now just make a little quote from uh, a more recent time, uh, the pre-industrial time of, uh, of Europe. And uh, sort of prior to the 18th century, frost fairs were common on many rivers in Europe. And the London diarist John Evelyn wrote that in 1683-1684, the Thames River froze from late December to early February. And he says, conditions were terrible, with men and cattle perishing, and the seas locked with ice such that no vessels could stir out or come in. The fowls, fish and birds and exotic plants and greens were universally perishing. Food and fuel were exceptionally dear and coal smoke hung so thickly that one could scarcely see across the street and one could scarcely breathe. That's pre-industrial climate in England. So when we hear these stories about uh, dangerous climate change, do we want to go back to pre-industrial climate in England? <laughs>